In our last video, we met the War Herd, a cannibalistic beast herd dominated by Bulgors and of course their larger cousins, the Saigor and the Gorgon. Today, we're going to continue exploring these little sub-factions in the Beast of Chaos book by taking a look at the Thunderscorn Beast Herds. Now, choosing to reside at the desolate peaks of various mountain ranges, the Thunderscorn stalk their slice of the mortal realms. And though their societies are far from most of the other civilized cultures of the mortal realms, they can travel extreme distances with a very unnerving speed. Their reptilian legs hurl them skyward, and they're able to descend on their prey in a moment's notice. And yes, I did say reptilian legs, because if you are not familiar with this subfaction, because frankly their models were not popular for a very long time, what you're really looking at is a half dragon, half ogre. Much like a centaur is the upper half of a man and then the body of a horse, dragon ogre is very similar when it comes to the ogre torso and arms and head. But from the waist down, he's sort of a dragon creature. Now, the ogre part, as we understand it, is fairly straightforward. Very humanoid, just large features, low to mid intelligence, very primitive culture. But the dragon part of him deserves some mention. Because, specifically, it's not just that he looks like one. There's a lot of cool implications with this. Because in Age of Sigmar, dragons often have a lot of abilities and attributes associated with them. For example, they can breathe lightning or the air pulses with power around them. They always seem to have this effect on their environment. Well, the same is true for dragon ogres. Because thunderstorms follow them wherever they go. If they're approaching a battlefield, the sky will darken, the air fills with static, and weapons begin to glow. And once they are on that battlefield, they charge straight at the enemy. No, using cunning or guile, not like the Brayherd do. They run straight for it, and they hit like a blast of lightning. You got dragon claws tearing up the ground and anything they can get within reach of. These ancient and colossal weapons swirling around in a flurry. And so it's interesting because they bring the storm in the sky just by their very presence, but they act as the storm in battle. And at the center of that storm is the dragon ogre Shagoth, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. Now, as mentioned before, history gets kind of tricky when you talk about cultures that have been around for so long and are also somewhat so primitive. They only have oral traditions to pass down, and how we get those oral traditions outside that culture is very vague. But the legend tells that in the old world, the dragon ogres made a pact with the chaos gods, and in exchange for eternal servitude, they would get eternal life. Now, when I say immortal, I mean they're immune to the aging process, but they can still be killed in combat. Now, after the destruction of the old world, a single dragon ogre, Shagoth, somehow survived, and he's in their legends as big as a mountain, and the idea was he woke up somehow before Sigmar did in Azir. And being the first one there, of the gods that we know, he brought his children somehow and stirred them, awakened them, into the mountains of Azir. But to their dismay, they found that their dark pact with the Chaos Gods was still in effect, and so they are a doomed race, forced into this eternal servitude to the powers of Chaos. Well, when Sigmar did awake and he came to his ear, he was immediately struck by having this chaos infestation in what he decided was his realm. Now, of course, Sigmar, of course, sees himself as the embodiment of Azir, and there is something about the gods and their connection to the realms, but of course, they were there first. But with that, he launched an all-out war against the Thunderscorn, because at the time, they would have been his primary enemy. There wasn't a lot of chaos in the realms, and so they were banished from Azir, which they truly see as their homeland. It's where their god put them. From Azir, they kind of scattered out to the various mountain ranges in the mortal realms. And so now they're kind of in this weird place where they're bitter about their servitude to chaos, but they're also bitter towards Sigmar, and so they kind of fit in this weird in-between spot. And the Age of Chaos, when that rolled in, gave them an opportunity to unleash this anger that had been building them and just pour it out on the mortal realms. Because joining with the other beasts of chaos, they became a very welcome addition. 
it's easy to see why with the mutation the way they value that as a treasure and all of a sudden these dragon owners show up and they are these servants of the dark gods who bring power of the heavens with them wherever they go and so the other beasts of chaos they revere and respect the dragon ogres and so now we're going to dive into the units and you'll notice there's only two entries which makes sense since these are supposed to be extremely rare creatures first i'll talk about the dragon ogres in general see since the dawn of the mortal realms these terrible creatures have existed they're hulking stature sees them looming above their enemies and the millennia that they can live for because they don't die of age has trained them to be extremely deadly in combat and they use those advantages to rush their enemy head on kill them and move on to the next target now in addition to their strength and skill a dragon ogre has one more advantage that is very important and that is their resiliency you see that lower half that is a dragon is actually covered in rock hard dragon scales. In fact, the only real weakness that a dragon ogre has is sort of his underbelly, like right where the ogre part meets the waistline of the dragon. Which, as you can imagine, as this beast is swinging a spear and axe and whatever ancient weapon he's throwing around, it gets very hard to reach. So he has a soft spot, it's hard to get to, but if you do manage to land a blow, well, they have one more surprise, and that is the fact that whenever they're struck by lightning, they heal in battle. And remember the fact that wherever they go, they bring a lightning storm with them. So these are not easy creatures to take out. They are in stark contrast to the very lightly armored, very easy to pin down and tear apart units that are in the rest of this army. Anything in the very hurt section, very easy to kill from a heavy weapon standpoint. But even the dragon ogres are hard to strike down. The weapons that they wield are forged from this raw azurite metal that they got back in the dawn of time. Some of these things are older than Sigmar is in the realms, carved in the days before Sigmar arrived and scattered them. And each one of these weapons, if they can find them, is a relic, and it's one that they've had almost millennia to train with. Now, some of the most ancient weapons, the ones that we would call artifacts in the game, are ones that they had and were lost when they were banished, but they go through great lengths to reclaim those weapons, destroying entire cities if they believe one is underground. And they come down from their mountains and they do terrible deeds to the mortal realms, and then when the season of hunting and raiding is over, the beast herd will return to their home, bringing back the corpses of champions or other kinds of dark trophies, and offer them up at the herdstone. They, of course, have their own types of herdstone, just like the other beast herds do. And if their offering is pleasing, an apocalyptic thunderstorm will rain down in the area. Now, the battle tome also notes that their herdstones are a little bit unique, just like the other ones were, uh, where there are, they're just massive in size. They can just move more materials than many other beast herds. And they're often metallic acting like lightning rods, which makes a lot of sense. It's how they heal, they feel connected to the storm. And the second unit, and of course the last one, is the Dragon Ogre Shagoth. There are few creatures as terrifying as what they describe in the Dragon Ogre Shagoth, because these are towers of flesh and scale and lightning. They look down on civilization from their mountain peaks and are just filled with hate. And they kind of bellow this call of war and the mountain shakes down to its foundation and the beast herd moves immediately to destroy whatever he has his eye on. And here's the thing we mentioned earlier that all dragon ogres are immune to the aging process but they can still die in battle. So a dragon ogre Shagoth is a dragon ogre that has survived for millennia. He's fought countless battles, he's led innumerable slaughters. And he's had that time to grow even larger and meaner and badder. The nails on the bottom of his like dragon feet have grown to these long almost spear end like weapons. The scales get harder. He even becomes more attuned to the storm. When you reach this level, you don't just bring the lightning wherever you go. Shagats can command the lightning. And whether it's true magic like using and manipulating the power of magic or it's just sheer willpower they arc power and lightning anywhere in their vision they are rare but incredibly cool sounding and incredibly strong they are ancient beyond understanding powerful in so many ways and they're sharp and cunning and ready to lead any herd against the forces of order 
So that's it, just the two units. So let's talk about why they are cool. Again, there's not a ton of lore on each of them individually, but two things particularly stood out to me as I was reading this and doing the paper research. The idea of where they land between Chaos and Azir fascinates me. I was really struck when I read the Battle Tome, and it says that they resent Chaos. Not, not necessarily Chaos itself, but their servitude towards it. And that puts them in a strange place compared to the other beasts of Chaos who relish in their ability to serve Chaos. And then you add the fact that Sigmar kicked them out of Azir, their native land and home. And I like that they don't really fit anywhere. They also resent this relationship they have with Chaos, but they're so infused with it they can't ever turn to the forces of order. They couldn't make a deal with Sigmar to like help free us. Nothing like that can happen. So they're in this weird in-between space that's going to leave them frustrated and angry for eternity. And because of that, they themselves don't really fit in anywhere. I mean, they obviously fit into Beasts of Chaos, but they make themselves distinct in so many ways, at least more so than the Warherd or Brayherd. So that constant struggle between, uh, I don't like serving or being forced to serve Chaos, but also the forces of order have certainly made themselves an enemy against me. And the second thing that really stuck out to me was they seem to be this dark reflection of Azir itself. The way they relate to the storm, it sounds, frankly, very stormcasty. Has a lot of the same ideas and words used. Again, I like this idea of there being creatures and forces within a realm that show you the darker sides of what that could be. Because, frankly, they are just as much of Azir as Sigmar's forces. In fact, they were there before Sigmar. Their god, the mountain-sized Shagath, according to their legends, carved out a place for them and put them there. Like, they have a right to be there, they embody that realm with their abilities, the way they heal with lightning, frankly, just like Stormcast do, and I found that so deeply fascinating. If you go to the main rulebook and you look up the lore for Gairan, the realm of life, there's a section there where they talk about this kind of struggle between two bands of Sylvaneth, and one of them really represents the life cycle of death, meaning that part where you're old, embittered, and you're pretty much towards your grave. There's a whole collection of Sylvaneth that live perpetually in that moment. That's the kind of thing where I'm talking about, where like the dragon ogres are very Azir-like creatures. They are things you would expect to find there. Like again, it's the dark half of that realm, much like the death cycle Sylvaneth are a dark part of what Giran truly means. Because of that, they seem evil and macabre, and frankly, those two are very similar ideas, and I absolutely love it, and I want to see more of it. More aspects of what the realms look like, it kind of gives us a fuller picture, and they don't have to be tied or related to any active gods in the stories. So friends, that is all there is about the Thunderscorn. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you've been enjoying my coverage of Beasts to Chaos. If you know someone who's interested in this army, go ahead and send them one of these videos. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you all so much for watching, and look forward to seeing you in my next lore video. Have an awesome day, and happy wargaming.